what's up everybody, Daniel here from Never Enough Tech. If you have been paying attention at all to the iPad OS 14 release, you might have a handful of features you are truly excited about. Maybe it's Scribble, the feature that converts handwritten text to typed text when written in a text box. Or perhaps shape recognition found in notes, screenshots, and photo markup. The feature that converts your pathetic wannabe circle into a fancy circle. Maybe it's compact Siri calls and search, or new privacy features. Lots of nifty newbie features for sure. Well, parties don't last forever, people. Put your champagne down, it's time to toss some shade. Toss, I got that right. We can never pat Apple on the back too long lest they get lazy and high horse. In this video, I will cover five features missing in action in iPad OS 14. Apple should remedy these promptly to prevent the iPad from becoming just a complete embarrassment. Why am I reading bear assment? Well, if we're being honest, we could all use one of those from time to time. Number one, improved external monitor support. Like, I'm like, I'm like Dwight at a paper salesman convention. Right now, the situation is pretty much this. You plug into an external monitor and you get the iPad screen. Just about the same ratio with huge unused space on both sides. The iPad screen doesn't change and the external view does exactly what the iPad screen does. All you really get is bigger. One cheesy cracker sandwich that external monitor support. Messy. I really hoped Apple was going to address this weakness this year by giving developers the tools they need to create a custom interface when an external monitor is detected. Yes, I know it's possible to take up the whole screen by streaming video. I believe this is how the somewhat popular Screen Shift app is able to take up the whole screen. Make no mistake, it's a hack. A clever hack, props to the developer, but it does not even support using your iPad apps. At most, you get a collection of browser windows, so problem not solved. Let's imagine better. For instance, an app developer may choose to disable the iPad screen, but have a custom interface fill the external monitor. Apple could at least do this for their native apps. A step further would be allowing the developer to again, take up the whole external monitor and use the iPad screen as an extension to open another instance of the app or open a different app. Maybe the developer could choose to turn the iPad screen into a dedicated control panel or toolbar menu screen, riddled with quick actions turning you into a legit superhero. Look at you, you're unstoppable. Just imagine all the new, I ditched my Mac for the iPad YouTube videos these improvements would spawn. I imagined it, it's a lot. Watch my other videos, it's an inside joke. While I'm frolicking around in this imaginary world, we should hope that the external monitor will support side-by-side -side multitasking. Maybe even side-by-side, -side, wait for it, by side multitasking. You know, with a scoop of slide over app. Not exaggerating, there are multitudes of productivity apps that could really go to the next level with some combination of these enhancements. Photo editing with your dedicated toolbar window. Video editing with all your clips on the iPad screen ready to be dragged into the timeline on the external monitor. Just hold on, going to quickly switch out my shiny hat for my magic hat and my magic sword for my shiny sword. Gaming. In all seriousness, it's gonna be interesting to see how far Apple lets iPad overlap with the Mac. Evidenced by the BFD migration to ARM processors. You know, the processors we have in iPads and iPhones. In the meantime, the iPad will remain hobbled, lurching to and fro, unable to reach its true productivity potential. Sad. Number two, Apple Pro Apps. John Prosser, or Mr. Know-It-All for two months in the early spring, kind of lit a fire with a tweet that Apple Pro Apps are coming to the iPad. This goes without saying, but there were no Pro App sightings this year at WWDC. As such, a continued knock on the iPad is its omission of Apple Pro apps. As a refresher, the Apple Pro apps are Logic Pro, Apple's Pro Audio Editing Suite, Final Cut Pro, Apple's professional video editing app, and Xcode, the tool used to build all your killer apps. Why so violent? Anyway, if a bunch of Mac users mainly use the Mac to run Pro apps, why would they bother with an iPad? At face, being able to run these apps on the iPad seems like it would prompt a sea change introducing Pro Apps to a whole new group that mainly use the iPad, convincing many Pro Mac users with iPads to adopt the iPad as their sole or main device, and perhaps convincing those users that have been avoiding iPads altogether 
that the iPad could now be a useful extension to their workflow, taking their iPad to a coffee shop to continue their app development instead of a bulky laptop. This is the theory anyway. While making these apps available to the iPad would be really swell, anyone who is familiar with these pro apps and the oddities of the iPad would immediately have questions on how it would all work. Here is where some of the challenges lie. You see, iPad OS derives much of its plucky charm by simplifying the computing experience. Not a criticism. You know the saying, like, brevity is the soul of wit or whatever. The iPad's like, let's centralize app installs. Let's hide file systems. Let's reduce clutter by allowing fewer choices on how to arrange windows. The iPad makes your computing experience easier by limiting your freedom. The thing is though, with pro apps, many users want choice and flexibility in both how they arrange their workspace, including using external monitors, oftentimes multiple monitors, and which third-party resources they can leverage to make the application more powerful. Regarding workspace freedom, many pros would feel constrained if they were limited to their three window max setup, split screen with a slide over window when perhaps they're used to having seven, eight, nine windows open to their specification, which is quite likely in an app like Logic Pro. Increased external monitor support would be great in this circumstance, but would maybe not totally address the problem. And as mentioned, external monitor support is not here yet, and its arrival time is far from clear. As you may very well know, when you use a Mac Pro app, in particular Final Cut, you are really buying the platform, not the content. What I mean is professionals are not that interested in Apple stock cringeworthy transitions and titles, but rather in using Final Cut as a platform for much cooler third-party content. You know, third parties that dedicate all their attention towards making transitions, titles, and special effects. Professionals are used to using a lot of plugins from all over the place. Here is an over-the-top example of a bunch of plugins. So pro users have all these plugins they would want to use. How would Apple distribute? Well, probably the App Store. Good money-making opportunity. But it's unclear if enough third parties would sign up for this kind of distribution, which would likely be critical for making Final Cut iPad viable. I also suspect pros would not be happy about rebuying plugins. I don't know. It's kind of messy. The Macs are increasingly becoming niche products, as opposed to obsolete because of their unique ability to run pro apps. I'm not sure how much Apple is willing to undercut this last stand for laptops and desktops, considering it's still a significant part of the business. Worth noting in WWDC, Apple spent time talking about how the iPad processor can handle pro apps. Fair enough, but instead of bringing the pro apps to the iPad, the iPad processor went to the pro apps on the Mac. I'm quite certain pro apps in some form are coming. But perhaps I can blame some of these issues I outlined if we're still waiting for proper pro apps years from now, or if they're dramatically scaled down from their Mac form. But you know, in the meantime, the iPad will just continue being a flop. This next one is a bit of a curveball. Number three, controlling the iPad with gestures. This expanded capability was not really covered in the WWDC keynote, but Apple and iOS 14 baked in a lot of tools around recognizing body parts and how they are moving. As sexy as this sounds just by itself, this opens up a whole world of controlling the iPad without touching it or yelling at Siri. It's not all that difficult to imagine scenarios where this might be helpful. Face recognition and then a finger gesture to unlock. Maybe not the gesture you're imagining. You're cooking, massaging the chicken wings. <laughs> and your hands are dirty and you don't want to touch the iPad, but you want the screen to scroll. Perhaps you're engaging in a medical procedure and you want to change the camera views, without getting body stuff all over the screen. But obviously the most critical application would be to start a TikTok thing, you know, when you're ready to, uh, tick rock. Stop using words. Possibilities are vast and I'm sure Apple is sitting on many ideas. Sitting on many ideas you are. With this new body part detection potential, I kind of wish Apple would have put in a little more work into packaging it. So let me make this clear. I could create an app right now and have you control everything with gestures without having to touch the app. I'm free to come up with all kinds of stupid ideas for how to implement this. The developer over there is free to implement their totally different stupid ideas as well. I could have you control the app with your hips. That was more fun than I thought. Anyway, we really need Apple to create a common strategy or user interface schemes for remote interface control. Making certain gestures common, like pinch to go home or swipes to change pages. Invent the body detection cursor. 
and the critical gestures like with a trackpad to create a common experience throughout the system. Anyway, since Apple has not yet put a shiny veneer on these body peeping functions, it was not highlighted in the keynote, nor much in the promotional material. Hopefully Apple is hard at work building this out and will have something amazing to show to the general audience next year. These next two are my favorites from my Why is iOS Not Sharing catalog. Number four, widgets. Widgets had a starring role in Apple's splashy promo video showcasing iOS 14. Widgets received a redesign, making them look more neat and stylized, wrangling them by giving the developer three sizes to work with. However, we all know the most critical change was jailbreak from Today View. Widgets are now free to live anywhere on the home screen other than the dock. Well, as it turns out, this long-awaited Today View jailbreak is exclusive to iOS. The iPad's widgets are still rather stuck. The iPad screen is a big canvas. Apple, you did all this work to make widgets presentable in the main space. Let the iPad widgets show out too. Why did Apple do this? My best guess is they are too in love with the elegance of their pin today view, keeping widgets neat, but also visible in the home screen. If this romantic notion is what's holding iPad's widgets back, Apple needs to get over it. Come on, Apple, let's bring it in. Just let go. Well, don't snot on my shirt. Last, and number five, iOS, why are you not sharing all your apps? We all, from time to time, can't complete a calculation in our head. Just every once in a while, an iPad user needs to do math. Yes, I know Spotlight does math. Hush, I'm doing a thing. Oh, chill, I'm hushing an imaginary person. What makes this frustrating is that Apple has a calculator app all worked out on iOS and watchOS and macOS. The Mac calculator is famous for being sketched out by Steve Jobs a thousand years ago. They could just port it over or maybe put in a little work to make it a bit more feature rich. Maybe adding calculation history. Are they afraid that providing a calculator on the iPad will reduce iPhone purchases? Is Apple afraid they will lose money on Big Calc in the App Store? Who knows? Anyway, Apple, it's time. It's time to stop being completely arbitrary in deciding which apps iPads get. Weather app. You know how many grandparents are getting soaked in the rain due to your absence? You know they can't download anything unless their grandchildren are visiting? I kid. And the Translate app you just released. Why do you only want iPhone users to be able to strike up a convo with a mysterious, differently lingual stranger? It's time to let go of the illusion that what you're doing here makes sense on any level. Come here. Oh, more boogers? I'm done. Viewers, do these things. Pretty please. Catch you on the next one.